children are dismissed for children's church. Our scripture reading this morning begins in Joshua 20, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state their case before the elders of that city. Then the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city and provide a place to live among them. If the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, the elders must not surrender the fugitive because the fugitive killed their neighbor unintentionally and without malice of forethought. They are to say they are to stay in the city until they have stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest who is serving at the time. Then they may go back to their own home in the town from which they fled. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kerath Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. East of the Jordan, on the other side of Jer from Jericho, they designated Bezer in the wilderness on the plateau in the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth and Gilead in the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan in the tribe of Manasseh. Any of the Israelites or any foreigner residing among them who, act, who killed someone accidentally could flee the, to there, could flee to these designated cities and not be killed by the avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. Chapter 21. Now the family heads of the Levites approached Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the other tribal families of Israel at Shiloh and Canaan and said to them, the Lord commanded through Moses that you give us towns to live in with pasture lands for our livestock. So the Lord had commanded, so as the Lord had commanded, the Israelites gave the Levites the following towns and pasture lands out of their own inheritance. And skipping down to verses, uh, to the end of that chapter in verses 41 through 45. The, town of the, the towns of the Levites in the territory held by the Israelites were 48 in all, together with their pasture lands. Each of these towns had pasture lands surrounding it. This was, for, this was true for all these towns. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had swore to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. Thank you, Jeff. Now, if you would take a copy of the scriptures, I hope you're open there already, and move back to chapter 13 in Joshua. I, um, because I was out last week, uh, we'll have missed one of our messages, and uh, Jeff read the passage for that, and I'm going to back up, and they're kind of layered together, and this whole business of, of them uh, taking uh, the land and what it meant. Um, so the, the layering of the, the cities of uh, refuge is an important concept in the ancient world because the ancient world and most of the world that we live in today is still driven by revenge cycles. If you do something uh, to my family, I have to get you back. I have to make that even. And so we're seeing that begin to really be played out all over our country right now as our, as our nation is uh, tribalized. But I want to back up and look at 
chapter 13, where uh, God began this conversation with uh, Joshua. And uh, so let me, let me just begin with a picture of this mess uh, that is at my house. Uh, this is my field. This is a field at my, my place. And this was forest nine years ago when I moved here. But this forest was casting shade on my house in the winter. And I, having come from California, don't like that at all. Uh, so I be, it took me years to conquer this place. And finally had uh, some loggers come in and finish the job up. And just last year, finally was able to mow that entire field with my, uh, you know, my domestic house uh, lawn tractor. And this year, the grass came up that we had planted, and it was so beautiful. We said, look how the wind blows in the grass. That's great. And I hear this plaintiff, don't cut it. And then the rains came, and I didn't cut it. And then the weeds got to be six and eight feet tall. And they obstructed all the markers where I had put markers that where the, the rock outcroppings were, that I wouldn't run over them with my lawnmower. And so I went out there to attack it with my brush whacker so I could clear the markers and see my way around there. And the bees were there and drove me out, those hornets did. And I said to myself, self, you lost it this summer. It's still conquered. There's a, there's a rock wall back there on that tree line. I have conquered it, but I have to maintain it. And so there's an important uh, principle here. Uh, enough of that mess. So hopefully by the end of the year, I will have it uh, conquered again and ready for next year. Uh, but Israel had fleshed out the territory by conquering, by, by Joshua um, leading them in conquering. And so they had created a new reality. God had taken Joshua's leadership and the people, and they did as they were commanded, and they took possession of much of this land. And that is an incredibly important principle, uh, that we are doing something that is of our own generation, and each new generation coming will have a little bit different or more advanced, different task than we have had. Just like in this story, Moses came and he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt as a nation where they had gone uh, centuries before as just a family. He now brought them out as a nation through the Red Sea, brought them to Sinai, gave them the law, they built uh, the furniture for the tabernacle, they made the tabernacle, they got themselves organized as tribes and in, in military fashion to move together and then they refused to go into the land and so Moses led them in the wilderness for 40 years and God said, okay Moses, you did your job. And you are not going to be the guy who brings them in. You have finished your life work. There's plenty of work more to do, but your part is done. You will not take them in. And now we have seen Joshua rises up, leads them in. And now at uh, chapter 13, it begins, Joshua, when he was old and well advanced in years, the Lord said to him, you are very old. And there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. That's really important. That, to me, is a, an insight for how God works. We get this idea that if I don't get everything done, it's not going to happen. Not so. We are part of something bigger that God is doing. And so uh, what we're seeing here, so, so God is going to tell him, uh, here, I want you to allot this land to Israel for an inheritance, even though it's not conquered yet. Do it as I have commanded you and divide this land up as an inheritance uh, for these tribes. And so he's saying, at the end of your life, I want you to take stock and I want you to show the shape of this fulfilling, this promise that's being fulfilled. 
it's the fulfillment from the past is now shaping the future. The past was Abraham uh, being given a promise. This land is yours, Abraham. I'm giving it to you and all your ancestors. And Abraham's thinking, I don't have any ancestors. How's this going to work? But lo and behold, he had a son, Isaac, and that promise was passed to him. And he had a son, Jacob, and that promise was passed to him. And Jacob had 12 sons. And in Genesis 49, he's laying in his deathbed, and he is giving out the inheritances that aren't going to be inherited for 400 years and more to his 12 sons. And so we're seeing that being fulfilled, and we're seeing the shape of this future that God is bringing. And so God promises here in, at the beginning of chapter 13, uh, so now divide this, uh, I myself will drive out uh, these tribes before the sons of Israel. I'll keep taking care of business even after you're gone. Don't worry about it. Only do this now. Uh, make this allotment. And so he does this. Uh, let's see if we can see. I never show maps of Israel. I never... I'm a big map guy. I was a geologist and a, and a navigator. Uh, but Israel is long and tall, and screens are wide and not tall. Uh, so it usually doesn't work very well. But what you see here is a list of all the names that God gives in chapter 13 of all the tribes where they had not yet conquered. So the Philistines, uh, the Can Canaanites, and the, the city of Jerusalem is not yet been conquered. And so that is something that is to be done in the future. And so um, this is the country. This is looking out over the Sea of Galilee area up in the north. It's a beautiful area. This is part of their inheritance. It's a land of where water comes up out of the ground up north of the Sea of Galilee. And it is just, uh, it's like the Garden of Eden there. It's just a delightful place. And, um, and there, this is the uh, spring or the falls at En Gedi uh, over uh, by Masada. And the water comes down into pools, but it's a dry, hot place. And so... Water is very precious. And so these, these are places where they're going to inherit. Now, here's the point. God's children inherit. Paul says in Galatians that if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed. He's not saying we're Jewish. He's saying we get to participate in the blessing of Abraham as those of us who are Gentiles, we have the right and the privilege of doing that very thing, of becoming what he calls heirs to according to the promise. So we are participants in that promise. And that's an important, very important concept. Uh, so we celebrate what God has done. We celebrate what God is doing. And we celebrate what God will do. Even in this Lord's Supper, this is what he has done for us, but right now he is keeping us going. He is nourishing our souls, and we're going to do this until the day we see him again. You see? And that's, so, so this encompasses, my life is just a little part of that. And there are other lives all around us, younger lives that are coming up, some lives that are coming near the end of their road. It's like um, what's well, called in the in you know New Testament theology now, but not yet. There's a big element of that in walking with Jesus. We are saved, but we are also being saved. There's more to come, and it's bigger and it's better, and that's a great thing. So now the first thing that they get to. Uh, when they go here in, in chapter 13, they, they give out, he says here in verse 7 of chapter 13, if you're there, he says, now divide this land 
as an inheritance for the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Well, what about the other guys? The other guys, I've already told, you know, they came from uh, the western side, uh, or excuse me, the eastern side of the Jordan over to the west. But when they were in that place wandering in the wilderness, they conquered some nations over there on the east side of the Jordan, and uh, a couple of the tribes said, look, we like this land. We have a lot of uh, cattle and, and flocks, and this is good land for grazing, and we'd like to stay here. And so uh, they, they took that land that was east of the Jordan. So there's some tribes who are in the east of the Jordan River, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, and going up north into uh, the Bashan country up there near Mount Hermon. It's a beautiful country. Uh, uh, but they decided that that's what they wanted, and Moses said, okay, you can inherit this. This can be your inheritance. You're not letting God choose your inheritance by lot. You're choosing it because it's convenient for you, and you like it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, sometimes God gives us what we want. And sometimes that's not always the best thing. Uh, but you know, it, Jesus said of, of people who, who practice their, their, you know, who pray and who give things to poor people, uh, if you do that, he says, in such a way, if you do that in such a way that everybody is looking at you, if you do it for that purpose, very well and good, I hope you had a good time because that's all you're getting. You have your reward, he says. Okay, if that's what. You, but if you want to be rewarded by your heavenly Father, then don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. You don't have to advertise your goodness, in other words. And that is the nature of the kingdom of heaven. And so these guys decided, well, sure, we're part of Israel, but we, you know, we like this, so we just want this. Okay, you can have it. Uh, it's away from the center. And the only stipulation was, you have to come, your fighting men have to come with us and cross the Jordan and help us fight these battles. Uh, and then you can go home and settle your place in your land. And so um, the, the main nation of Israel is going to be in Israel proper, and it's going to be uh, the part that's west of the Jordan, where it says Jerusalem there. And so, when they, so that's what he means by the nine and a half tribes. So he says, he says to them, um, go and, and give out the allotments. And he doesn't mean you pick by lot which one's going to be next. The one that's going to be next is always going to be decided. It's already been decided back in Genesis 49 by Jacob. The first one that's picked for uh, inheritance is Judah. And if you want to see that, turn to chapter 15 and just look at the first verse. The allotment for the tribe of Judah, clan by clan, extended down to the territory of Edom, to the desert of Zin in the extreme south. Now, so he just, he gives them, you're first. Um... Why? Because Jacob said, Judah, you are my fourth son, and you're the one that I'm treating as my first, my oldest, because the other guys have done bad things and they're out. But you, you, from you, you're going to receive this blessing, this blessing that was given to Abraham, this promise. From you is going to come the tribe, of, you are the tribe of the kings. From you is going to come kings. And so Judah is chosen first. And by lot, uh, they received the area in the south. And so this is all the, the area west of the Jordan, how the tr tribes laid out. The first one was Judah, right underneath Jerusalem there, first. And then all of Joseph, which is Manasseh and Ephraim, you see there in the middle. And that's nicer watered country. What Judah inherits is desert. It is a dry place. It's a dry place, but it's also going to be 
the place where the city of David is and where the kings are and where the Messiah is going to be crucified and raised again. Uh, it's said in one of our modern novels that God created the desert to train the faithful. And so if you give somebody uh, lots of uh, inheritance, money-wise, and, and give them lovely pasture land, you probably don't ever hear from them again. But these guys out in the desert, they get an intensity about them. And so God does this uh, on purpose. Uh, but it says now at the end of this chapter, uh, it says at the end of uh, chapter 15 that the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. So the Jebusites continued to live among the children of Judah in Jerusalem uh, to this day. And so we see Judah receives first. Uh, they receive the biggest pieces and they're in the center part of the country. Um, so they're, they're kind of the middle of the body of, of, of Israel. They compose it. And, and the other uh, smaller tribes, I don't know if they're, how much smaller they are, but the, less, the ones that weren't blessed and chosen as first, uh, the reason Judah's chosen is because he, he sacrificed himself. He offered himself as a sacrifice in place of his brother Benjamin in order to get uh, Benjamin back from Egypt. And then Joseph is chosen and given a double portion. Each of his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, get a, get the, a full portion. Uh, and he's given that because he saved the day in Egypt. Uh, but it is a dry place, this place of Judah. And, uh, but it's not distracting. <laughs> it makes you think. It makes you meditate. And so... Uh, we get a lot of uh, the Psalms come from this place. Uh, the Lord, uh, David uh, appeals to the Lord in a dry and a thirsty place that he's got to survive in. But then uh, the tribes of, of Manasseh and Ephraim uh, in, in chapter 17, uh, if you want to look there, uh, verses uh, 17, it says that Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, you are a numerous people with great strength. They were complaining that they didn't have enough property or, or uh, territory. You shouldn't have just one allotment. Well, of course they shouldn't, because God gave them a double portion. But here's the deal. Because, this is verse 18 in chapter 17 of Joshua, because the hill country should be yours, though it is a forest, you will clear it. Well, that sounds hard. And to its farthest borders, it will be yours. For you will drive out the Canaanites, even though they have iron chariots, and even though they are strong. The Canaanites were down there on that coastal plain where they could run chariots. It's flatter down there, and that's why the Israelites were up in the hill country. Uh, let's go back and look here. You see the hills up there? Uh, just on the, on the left side of the Jordan, that's where most of Israel was, and that's where the conquered territory was, and down toward the Mediterranean Sea, where it's flat down there, that's the part that they hadn't conquered yet, and that's the hard part, because those guys down there, they got iron chariots, and they're a little harder to deal with uh, than uh, the people that they were prepared to, to, to do war with. And so Joshua says, yep, you can have more property. You're going to have to conquer it, though. And the point I want you to grab out of this that takes us right to the New Testament is that the greatest tasks are given to those with the greatest gifts. Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. And that's an important concept. It means we need to be grateful people. Not just, hey, look at all this stuff I got. This is great. Yes, it is great. And here's what the Lord expects of us, having all these things. So there's tasks left. I'm leaving people with iron chariots for the tribes of Joseph to drive out. I'm leaving Jebusites in Jerusalem 
David's going to have to take that city in combat. Uh, and he will, but it's going to be centuries before that happens. Some people are born with a life mission just to get a family together that's anywhere near as good as the one some of you grew up in, you see. If you get saved um, and you were, you, you, had, you were raised in a family with a single mom and, and you ended up in trouble, you're going to have to learn how to do some things that other people already know how to do. If you were raised in a Christian family, don't think of yourselves as superior. Think of yourselves as having, oh, I'm responsible here because there's people who don't have anywhere near what I have. And God expects me to bless them, to help them to get their houses and their lives going in his direction. Some people are born with abilities and resources that others can survive on. I was in a briefing uh, preparing for a mission a long time ago in the Air Force, and I heard our operations officer uh, introduce a new pilot. He said to this pilot, he pointed at him. He was a guy who pointed a lot and made very direct statements, and you listen to him. He says, I want you to follow this guy. And he pointed to another pilot who was one of our regulars. He said, because you, and you just keep your eyes on him and you follow him because you can live off of what falls out of his back pockets. And I remember that. And I think to myself, it isn't fair. It isn't fair that some people are so strong and so smart and so clever and yet, God puts us in here with our differences. And he gives us to one another. And there are some people that you can live off what falls out of their back pockets. And God does that on purpose. He gives us practice at not falling into humanity's biggest trap, the trap of envy and coveting. Tenth commandment, don't covet what is your neighbor's. It's the easiest way to start a revolution. If you want to make trouble, just stir up envy and call it injustice. It's not fair. Those people are cheating you. Let's go get them. That's how virtually everything in the news starts these days. But God knows what we need. God knows what we need, and he knows what we can handle as well. Uh, some of us just couldn't handle that kind of uh, gifting. And we have gifting in other things. Uh, I heard a great thing this week, and this is worth remembering. Because uh, it, it just rings true with, with everything I read in, in this word and, and in this life. That happiness, excuse me, happiness is when you receive something, receive a gift. You get happy when you get gifts, right, at Christmas? Happiness is to receive a blessing. And so God blesses us, and it makes us happy, at least until we figure out we need another blessing or want another blessing. But joy, joy is when you get to be a blessing to somebody. And that's, that's so built into being parents. And so that's one of the great rewards for all the, uh, how beat up you get being a parent is that you find the joy of pouring yourself into uh, a little one's life and watching them grow and become uh, someone who lives totally in God's image. And so uh, God knows what he is giving. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, there are various kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. And so it's God who chooses the gifts he gives. They... They drew lots for to, to see where the territory was that they would inherit. Judah drew first, then Joseph, their descendants, as it were. And God chooses. When, it's, when you're drawing lots, then you're saying it's up to God. And we're the same way. And the point is that we ought to be happy with our inheritance. Now, we have equality 
among us. We have the same Lord, just like they were all members of the nation of Israel. They had the same God. We have the same Lord, the same Spirit in us. We have the same Word of God. And we are all adopted sons and daughters of the High King. In that, we are equal, right? And that is a wonderful thing. But God gives a diversity of gifts. Judah lives in the desert. Joseph lives where the springs run. We have spiritual gifts. We are all born again. But when we are born again, which is a miracle, God doing something in a naturally occurring process that is called you or me, he changes us into a heavenly being. We have a future uh, somewhere else. He gives us an inheritance. He gives us a unique one. Uh, we all have different spiritual gifts. And if you want to read in the scripture about spiritual gifts, uh, start with Romans chapter 12, and then go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's the next book after Romans. And then skip a couple of books and go to Ephesians and read in chapter 4. And he gives lists, different lists of different gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so your past, that is the fact that you were born again with the same Lord, the same word, the same spirit, the same adoption, but you were given a unique gift or set of gifts. And I'm not talking about talents here. I'm not talking about musical ability, athletic ability, or anything else, I'm talking about a spiritual inclination towards certain kinds of service that we do. Your past is the shape for your future. The shape, the, the lot you draw that God gives you is your particular uh, thing that, that you just have to do as his child. And so, just like the tribes of Israel, uh, they inherited very different places in that land some of us, Paul says, have more faith than others. I, I know, it's true. And some people just are amazing uh, at their insight into the spiritual realm. And sometimes I just, what? What are you talking about? And there are certain people I learn to listen to more carefully because I know they're tuned in in a certain way that I am not. Uh, it says that some will be apostles, uh, but most of us will just be kind of hometown family folks uh, because that's, that's what the seed he is planting in this world. Some people are born into Christian families, others not. And so those that are born into Christian families, they are responsible. That's how the churches in the New Testament got going. Uh, they were... Um, they were started and organized around people that came from the synagogue. Paul went to the synagogue. He gathered up a handful of believers, usually got thrown out of the synagogue, but he took those new believers with him. Some of them were Jewish, some of them were Gentile, who were God-fearers, and they became the elders and the, the people who understood uh, the law of Moses, they understood the prophets, they understood the Torah, and now they, uh, the, the writings and the wisdom, and now they believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And so uh, the other people that got saved coming straight off the, the marketplace, to them, let's see, world well, religion, let's see. Um, let's see, you go down to the temple, you drink a lot of wine, um, you find a prostitute, um, you wake up a couple days later, Paul says, nope, that's not how it works. And so those people who come from the synagogue, they had a leg up. They understood the morals, the ethics, and how God operated among his people. And so some of us are responsible that way. So you, using those gifts, is the shape of the church into the next generation. Your gift is part of your inheritance, and you have to, that gift is like that field of mine. It can be a mess. You were made to be a teacher, but you never practiced. You've never taught anyone. Well, maybe you're not a very good teacher because you, don't, you didn't learn how to teach. 
You know, you're natural at it if you develop it. You have to conquer it. You have to develop it. You have to deal with the rock outcrops. You have to deal with the stumps. You've got to work it out. And that's going to take your whole life. I mean, that is going to consume your life. To learn, to practice, and to grow in doing what God has made you to do. Whether it, whatever it is. And then we stop every once in a while. And we celebrate. Look what God has done. Oh, of course we have miles to go. We have all kinds of stuff to fix. But look what he's done so far. Look how it's changed. Some of you just can't stop teaching. Some of you just can't stop bringing people to Jesus. You're evangelists. Some people, you just can't stop organizing things. You know, you start with your lunch pail. You just, blah, blah. And some of us really love people that know how to organize things. I know how to organize. I just don't want to. I mean, that's where we live. So some people know how to fund things. And usually people that have the gift of giving are the people that have the gift of knowing how to make money. And they're just gregarious. It's very funny to them, all this. They make dollars do tricks, and they're the people who don't have trouble uh, with worshiping money. Because they, well, it comes, it goes. And they're the ones who, who give to all kinds of things. In fact, we have a young adult right now in our uh, bridge group who needs help going to Israel. And some of you mentioned that uh, you didn't want to go to Israel, but you'd be happy to help some who needed uh, funding. And so uh, for some of you that have that gift, uh, we have somebody that has one of those kind of needs. We have a fund set up, uh, Israel Serve and Learn Fund. So that would be an opportunity for you to do that. And so we all have, we're whole beings, we're all saved in Christ, we all have these things in common, and yet we're fantastically different. Uh, and that is the glory of being part of uh, Christ's body. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians, to each one of us, grace was given in keeping with the measure of Messiah's gift. So some of us have more gifts than others. I mean, I don't know why that's fair. But he says it's the way it is. Some of you have to tame the desert. And some of you get to have nice forests and creeks. He himself gave some to be uh, apostles. And they're just the people that have to do this. And thank God for those people. Some he gave as prophets. Now, you know, I wish they just always telling the truth. You know, and I don't want the truth right now because it's very inconvenient. Those people. Some as evangelists, proclaimers of the good news. Some as shepherds, some as teachers. He says, he goes on, and they do this to equip the holy ones, all of us, for the work of service, to help us figure out our own gifts and get us going in the right direction. And he says, here's the end of the story. This will continue until we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature adulthood, to the measure of the stature of Messiah's fullness. The bigness of who Jesus is, we're trying to fill that up, and we're not even close. But he's taken us there. He's making us those people. And so God starts the invasion by conquering our hearts. That's why Jesus came, to conquer our hearts and to get us started walking with him. And then, when we are his children, he is our Lord, he is our king, he gives us an inheritance. And it is a delightful thing to be his child. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, uh, that, that you bring us through this life and you say to us at one point, well, I want you to gather all your stuff up and write it down. I want you to allot I want you to give the inheritance out. I want you to speak what you've learned in your lifetime and share it with the next generation. Get them ready for the task that they have in front of them because it's going to be just as hard for them as it was for you. Thank you that you do that, that you, you make us pay attention to one another and help one another 
because we're all in Messiah Jesus. We're all in Christ. Lord, for whoever is here today who doesn't know you, who has not uh, had accepted your spirit into their life, your lordship, who has not taken your forgiveness, would you hear them as they reach out to you today in faith and say, Lord, I need that. I want to be part of this, and I want to see what amazing gifts you will give to me that I have to conquer, that I have to develop, that I have to grow for my lifetime project. And I do it along with everybody else in order to help everybody else. Thank you for making us all part of this body together. Be glorified in us, Lord. Hear the prayers of those who would reach to you today and become your children by faith, just by saying, Lord, I need you, and I'm going to follow you the rest of my days. And we'll thank you for that, Lord, in the name of our powerful King, Jesus. Amen.